I met her literally right there at the airport. Long story short, uh, the, the, the airport uh, chairman of the board, his name is Musa Billity. He has, or had, I don't know if the young man is still here, Leo uh, Fofana. You, some of you may know him, but he's Musa Billity's brother. He lives here in Atlanta. He has, uh, or had a car dealership. And sometimes with used car dealers, legal issues come up. So long story short, I had interacted with him and represented him, and I had interacted with Musa Billity and others uh, in Liberia. So while I was there, the board of directors for the airport, seven individuals, not Ellen Corcoran, but seven individuals that were in charge of the airport board of directors, they approached me and said that Delta Airlines is Liberia's number one client. Of course, we all know living here in Atlanta that Delta Airlines is based here. So they explained to me that they were having some issues with Delta and they needed somebody with legal background that was able and willing to go back and forth and help resolve these issues. And since they knew for the past umpteen years, I had been going back and forth Liberia every two, three months, they thought that I could help. And so when I considered it, along with uh, Delta Airlines, there were some other airlines and some other legal issues that were ongoing, uh, RIA being an international airport. And so most of the clients, the airlines, of course, were international. Long story short, the board of directors, again, comprising of seven individuals, after we talked and I agreed, in principle, they had a meeting, they had a resolution, they reduced it to minutes, they gave me a copy, and they, at that point, asked me and I agreed to work as legal advisor for the airport. And so that's how I started working with Ellen Corcoran. Now, when I met Ellen Corcoran at the airport, she had only been in Liberia about a week or so working there, and so she was new, I was new. Long story short, Ellen Corcoran and I, of course, we started working together to see how we could improve the airport, how we could help Mama Liberia, and uh, then we immediately discovered the practices that I guess we've all talked about in Liberia. One of them is a phenomenon that is called ghost employee. Additionally, I pointed out the faulty equipment that were still listed, but had been destroyed during the war. And during this meeting, which was also recorded, uh, Dr. McLean said, well, if they've been going about flying or all this thing, they can just keep flying like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so then, I said, and then, then, and then Judy Moore in the meeting too, he said, but it's only needed when, the yeah, when the pilot can't see you. Oh. <laughs> I mean, we're laughing about this, but again, and, and this is being, this is on recording. And so I, I, I said, but no, we actually have to put the equipment in because not every day they'll be able to see if that's the logic y'all are using. But that's not why the equipment is there. It's just because it's supposed to be. So I said, we have to get this equipment in because right now, okay, mind you, the, the one that's telling the pilots we got is not there because it got broken in the war. And by 2012, we were nine years post-war, right? About nine years post-war, and we still had not corrected that. So when an American carrier, an American airline comes into Liberia, and for their own monetary gain, because they want that route, and they're mandated by the FAA, they put in an equipment. But because we're years later, they put in something even more sophisticated that benefits everyone. Yet and still, our people don't see the urgency to, to publish this thing. Now, we also spoke about the, when I say we, I'm talking about me, the president, and, and um, you know, some of our staff members, about equipment needed at the airport. So during this three and a half months that I was there, supposedly they passed a budget for LAA, for the Liberian Airport Authority. I heard it was $10 million. One penny we never got. Whatever it is that they do with the money, I don't know. I don't know if it comes in the third quarter, and I wasn't there during the third quarter of the fiscal year what their reasoning was. So what we did was we were living on the, the funds, when I said we, I'm talking about in terms of making employees salary and different things, we're living off of the, the income that we're getting from the airlines. Because the airlines, they had to pay a particular amount to, to use the, uh, 
the airport facility and so forth. And uh, the judge would talk a little bit more about that because those are some of the contracts that he was working on with the airlines so that we could have the Deltas, the S and Brussels and so forth begin to pay Liberia more because these contracts were drawn when they first came to the country after the war. So even nine years post-war, some of them had already been operating maybe five, six years. They had never, the contracts had already expired. But I don't know, somehow people are just so complacent. You, they're having these American and foreign carriers still operate on expired contracts. I mean, do we not deserve more? What about the cost of living? Cost of living goes up. Ghana and other airlines, I mean, other countries, they're holding these people to the wire to say, look, three years later when we re renegotiate these contracts, you may have been paying $42,000 a month to use the air field, but guess what? The, the, the market value now is $60,000 or something. What does that mean? It means that when employees got more money that we can pay them so that they're not only buying that one bank of rice, but they're able to send money up country for the mother that's dying for typhoid. So, but I'll bring it back to the safety thing that I talked to the president and them about. So after that discussion, I sent a memo also. So not only did I have a meeting, that I recorded, but I sent a memo and I outlined the whole thing. The president called me in her office. I, I think the memo got to her, it was like a Monday morning she got it. So by eight something, I got a call. I was up at Robert's Hill. Hold on for my president. So the call came, I, she, I came. Be in my office by 11 o'clock. I said, Roger that, my president. So I got ready, I drove down to Morovia, got there, I got in the, in the office. I yelling you know, why you ain't put that thing in writing? You put that kind of stuff in writing, it got onto the media, it would just embarrass us. You can't put stuff like this in writing. Now, this is me just capturing, you know, one, two, three, four, five. These are the things that we need to fix. These are the things that I've learned about since I've been here. We need funding for this. I mean, just like any of us who write a memo to our boss here. I thought I was doing the right thing, but I got blasted verbally for that. And yet and still, and then, so not only did I have a meeting with the president, but then I also had a meeting with the Minister of Finance. I mean, and we're talking about grown men at the minister level that sit there and they get that little kick off of whatever power they fill that position because they've been appointed as ministers. So there's some kind of kick that they get out of that. So they start the meeting about an hour late, and that's, that's a good day if the meeting starts an hour late. They sit there, they're talking about their girlfriends, they're talking about the, the, the DSTV, I didn't even know what DSTV was at the time. I think it's some DSTV kind of cable. Local cable. Yeah. <laughs> so they're talking about that, that cable TV, the kind of power they got, and, and, and who got more power than, I mean, it's like some egotistical uh, 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 field day that's going on there. So during one such meeting, I sat there, and you will hear this recording because we're releasing more and more recordings. So you'll hear this recording at the Ministry of Finance. And I'm talking, um, they went on just babbling about all this e egotistical stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with the country. So at some point I said, time out. I stood up, I said, time out. We have to talk about what's going on at the airport. We're talking about the lives of you know, our sons and daughters that will be coming in and out of this airport. And if nothing is done, there will be a crash. Because I was aware of all the violations. And then one of the ministers gets up, Ellen, you're not just gonna stand up in my meeting. I don't want to get it power yet. Nobody can just stand up in my music. I mean, the guy goes into some kind of wreck. And I say, you know what? I, I have on record that I've made it clear to each and every one of you that this is an emergency and we have to intervene at the airport. So it's not just a band-aid thing that you're just trying to fix, but we got to get to the root and fix things. So anyway, that meeting went on. Nothing happened. By this time, we're not only dealing with the safety violations, we're dealing with the ghost employee stuff. We're dealing with, I mean, the, the, the gas station, we're dealing with, oh, and then when I would go to meetings, we had another meeting one time where they were trying to get some equipment, because uh, they, I mean, it, the, the airport is so lacking, so anything you can think about, we needed it. So supposedly the board chair was getting some equipment, he and the Minister of Transport, Eugene Nagwe at the time, so this was Musa Billington and Eugene Nagwe, they were both working with some company out of Nigeria to get equipment. And I said, well, I had met the uh, managing director for the airports for Ghana, a woman as well. And um, so she and I, as, you know, we established relationship and I would email her or call her. So whenever I had questions about how do I face this particular type of a contract, if I'm dealing with a vendor and so forth, you know, what are some of the pitfalls you guys had in Ghana? 
what do I need to avoid, or just call for advice. So when they had negotiated, when Eugene Nagme and Billiton had negotiated this contract with this Nigerian company, the company was also called NACO. For some reason, they, the Nigerian government have got dealings with like three companies called NACO. Some, it has a variation of spelling, but there's so much money going to a bunch of NACO companies that has ties with like the, the Ministry of State and the uh, Ministry of Finance and the board chair. So there's something about some NACO stuff, so just keep your ears open for that throughout. But anyway, so when it made this negotiation, so I came to the table because Ghana has sent me their contract, what they negotiated, so I could use that as a baseline. Now, granted, Liberia didn't have all the standards, you know, we didn't have the, the, the type of airport Ghana had and so forth. So at that particular point, we could not expect the same thing that Ghana was getting in return. But for example, if that company was coming in, as opposed to us maybe only getting 3% on, you know, say once the equipment is paid off, they were negotiating something around 3% is what we were going to benefit from, we as in Liberians. When Ghana was at, I don't know, probably, probably like 20 something percent, I said no. Based on the contract I read from the, the Ghana folks, I said we, we can at least start at 15 percent. We'll, you know, another three, four years as our airport build up will go up maybe another three percent. Eventually we'll be where Ghana is and we can demand more from these companies. Um, when I got in there, the board chair, the, uh, the other folks, you know, who, were, who have been doing the negotiation, they were quite, they were quite shocked that I had a baseline to go off of. And it's that, why are you bringing this Harvard negotiation thing here? <laughs> I said, you know. Not in Morocco, yeah. Right. So those were the kinds of things that I was faced with. Uh, we were faced with, I should say. So anyway, um, I, will, I will just bring this to a close in terms of the airport safety piece. Because as each of you may know, well, first let me ask you, Around February time in Liberia, we got Hamatan season, right? I think we all know. It's misty, foggy, and that's the time we wear sweaters at home. You know, because it's like the chilliest time of the year, and then early in the morning, you got the dew coming down. So when you think about Robert's Field area, you've got, um, what's that place called? Charles, Charlesville? Charlesville. Charles. Right, so it's quite dense, the, uh, the, fog. The, the fog, the vegetation, and so forth. So. February of last year, in fact, February 11th, our Armed Forces Day, we had different countries flying in to pay tribute to us, respect and honor us for our Armed Forces Day. And one such country was Guinea. So the head of the Guinean military and 10 other members were on a flight on that, that, that early that Monday morning, flying from Conakry to Morovia, a military jet. About 7.03 that morning, just short of a of, of, of final. Final is like right when the aircraft comes to touch down, you know, we've got our gear down, we're ready. So just short of, and this is, this is one of the most critical times that you're coming in because even with the FAA regulations, if you don't see the runway markings or lights at the runway, you have to abort the landing and take off even when you're coming under the instruments. So they, but the instruments are also so sophisticated that it will get you close enough to the ground that you don't have to be guessing, gee, I wonder not a runway right here. Is this runway, you know, with this particular direction? Or that it on this side when in fact, it might just be a line or a road and power lines and trees and houses over here. So you have to be quite, on, very much on center line when you're coming. That's what the instruments allow you to do. So. That aircraft are coming in, on short final coming into Monrovia in a heavy fog, mist, and so forth at seven o'clock in the morning. Right before the runway, they crash and, and everybody on the aircraft died. 11 people, so that means the head of the Guinean military, the, the pilot, the other crew members, some other military people, they kissed their wives and children goodbye that morning, they were supposed to be flying back at the end of the ceremony later that day. The instruments that we told them we had so they could be able to dial it in. Because remember when I was sitting in that meeting with McLean, with Minister McLean, and then when I told them about the instrument, they said, but they only not need it when the weather not bad. I mean, who even says that? But obviously there are times when the weather is bad. But that's not even the point. You're just supposed to have it, period. Because at, at a minimum, you're used as a backup. 
soil, but during adverse weather, it's not a backup. That's the primary way of you coming to bring the aircraft in. So 11 people died that morning that were coming to pay like bruh tribute. Like bruh have been lying and continues to lie to this day about equipment at the airport. And I'm now talking about safety navigation equipment. And then, not only did we lie to these people, because by this time we have not put anything in place for other pilots to know to dial 101.3 or so. The equipment is already there. Delta has paid over a million dollars. Delta pilots can see it when they come in. But anybody else, you just don't have the map. But if you got the map, the map will tell you what tune to dial. When you get to 10,000 feet, what are you gonna turn left, right, and so forth. You get to 8,000 feet, do this, do that, etc. So we did not afford that uh, uh, safety equipment to our, to our fellow Guineans that were coming into Liberia. After the crash and landed, reports, now I wasn't there to see this, but the report that we read here on the various newspapers was that the people were in the plane, they were still alive, they were crying and waving. Burning. Burning. No, we didn't have the equipment. This is just short no of the runway no at the airport. No we're supposed to have ambulance there. We're supposed to have fire trucks. We're supposed to have people who are trained so that, excuse me, when you do have a crash, that you can get to the the uh, the, 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 the site of the crash right away and have the equipment to be able to, what are you, I don't know what they call it, jacking the plane or how to do with cars and stuff, to get human beings out of those things. But the human beings were waving and died right there on site. First of all, the crash should not have happened. And then when it happened, they should have gone ahead and made sure that it got there on time. So I sent a memo to the president after the crash happened, addressing the very thing I had brought up before that we needed to have. So then, her office, they actually sent me a letter back and said that if I keep talking about this, they will take legal actions against me. So, I mean, I was thinking, even if you tell me that you'll put it in writing, and then, and then they said, to this, we are seeing the Minister of Justice, Christina Tan, uh, Siwa Cooper, who is one of the president's uh, legal advisors or lawyers, and a bunch of other lawyers in our brother CC, because I'm addressing again about the safety violations at the airport. Not too long after that, there were still more talks about them coming up and drawing up an indictment. Shortly after that, they went and they actually convinced a grand jury in Liberia that an indictment should be drawn out against us. And now let the judge continue on and talk more about it, but as you can see, it is by God's will that we're standing in front of you today. Because when they come up and make up these stories, just because you're trying to get the truth out in the safety and the interest of everybody, God will not allow those lies to go forward and for it to be held against you. Let me quickly touch on something that she explained. When I, as she was talking, I looked at your faces. I didn't know if you understood this. When she's talking about the instrument, if you're flying from point A to point B as a pilot, before you get in the airplane, you go through a pre-flight check. One of the things you do is you check the airport you're going to and see basically what radio station they have. Uh, the system will tell you if you're going to Robbers Field, when you get, let's say, within 10 miles, turn your radio to 99.9 FM. So you would check all of that, and you would know that when I get within 10 miles of Robert Field, let me turn my radio to 99.9 FM. If Robert Fields actually has the equipment that they say they have, when you get within 10 miles and you turn your radio, your radio in your airplane will connect with the equipment at the airport. Then on your screen, your screen will tell you, go to the left, because you're in the air, you can't see. Clouds, raining, you can't see. So your plane will tell you, go to the left, go to the right, come down, blah, blah. So the system will guide you straight onto the airport. Liberia puts in the system that we have this equipment. When you get within 10 miles, just turn your radio to the 99.9. .9. So when you fly for another country, you're thinking that this is true. This is not ghost. So when you get within 10 miles, of course, when you fly, you now calculate your fuel. So you're not, you're not planning to say, if they lying to me, I will just take off and come back home. So when you get within 10 miles and you turn your radio, nothing happens. So now you, the pilot, you have to guess, and you have to try to figure out how to land. And so this is the safety stuff that she was talking about. So basically, as we noticed all these things, we were bringing it up, we, we became enemies of the government. 
we started hearing from the people who were driving these ministers. They would pull us to the side and say, Pape, in La Brua, even if you're young like me, they can call you Pape. Yeah. They say, Pape, uh, I'm driving for Susu and So. And I was in the car. They were saying that they got to get rid of you and Madam Cochran because you're not bringing the American thing yet. You're stopping the chopping. But just be careful, watch your back. So we started hearing these things over and over and over. Liberia is dark. Uh, the people that were that we were hearing were plotting against us, they got guns. We don't have guns. So Ellen Corcoran and I got together and we had a moment of truth. We had to decide what do we do. Here we are trying to do what we can for Liberia. We don't need to go back. We don't need anything from Liberia. God has blessed us abundantly in the U.S. We want to give back. But at the same time, our lives now are being threatened. So what do we do? Do we just get up and leave and go back to the U.S. and say, forget about these people's business? Do we stay quiet and not talk about the safety and just go along with it? And so that was when we decided, you know what? After some prayer and reflection, if we have to be the sacrificial lambs, if we have to be the ones that, God forbid, will die so this there will be changes, then we will be the ones. We'll go and we'll record them, and we'll take these recordings and make it public so hopefully it would turn the way, it would change the way people do things in Liberia. And so that was when we started making these recordings. The way we would do the recordings, if we heard, for instance, Brother Joe was one of the people who was plotting against us, we would study his activities. If he partied on Saturday, then early Sunday morning around 6, we'll go to his house. we we'll knock on his door, Brother Joe would wake him up, he comes to the door, he said, what happened? He said, Brother Joe, sorry to wake you up, but..." You know, you're on the board of directors, and we are hearing that William over here is plotting against us, and he's saying that they're trying to get rid of us, and they're trying to set us up. Joe is the one who we heard that is plotting now, but we were telling him, he said, that William. Then Joe would say, but now why you wake me up for? We said, yeah. He said, oh, but, and we're recording him. He said, no, but I know you ain't do nothing. In fact, let me tell you about William. William Nasty, he not do this, he not do that, he not do this. And so this is the way we're going around getting these recordings. Then we decided, let's approach uh, Defense Minister Brani Samukai. Not because he was a part of the plot, not because we heard he was stealing money, but he's the highest ranking security officer in the country, the head of the military. So if your life is being threatened, if your security is being compromised, and you know him the way she knows him and I know him, it makes sense to talk to him. He has a son in the U.S. that I also represented. And so in representing his son, I got a chance to forge a relationship with him. So long story short, we go to Minister Samukai to see, look, there, there's threats against us. There's no light. Uh, these roads are tricky. They're windy. We hear about harm robbers. Do you have any advice for us? When we go to Defense Minister Brani Samukai, we are thinking that the reason they're plotting against us is because we're not stopped their ghost employee chopping. The safety issues she's raising at the airport, they don't, want, they don't want her to talk about it. We're figuring we're not close down the gas station, stealing the VIP lounge. This is what we're thinking. We go to Defense Minister Brani Samukai, and he says, I, I've heard about this. I have already been investigating. He says, in fact, the VIP lounge, the safety, those things are peanuts. The real reason why they're plotting against y'all is because there's $130 million that is coming from Equatorial Guinea to repair the airport. And I, Brani Samukai, I talked to the finance minister, I talked to Musa Bilite, I talked to Edward McLean, I talked to Judy Moore, and I, Musa Bilite, asked, I, Brani Samukai, asked them. I said, did these people take $1? Did they harm anybody? He said, and they told me that you didn't take $1, you ain't harm nobody. But this American thing you're not bring here, if you all stay here, they will, you all will block that chopping. So they have to get rid of you. This is what the defense minister is telling us on recording. Mm. So long Wait, story. Let me ask something quickly. So when defense minister said this, he, he actually said that, um, well, the 130 million dollars will come into the airport. As we all know, with the ghost schools, ghost, ghost everything. everything it was coming under the auspices of being for the airport. But 
we, as it turns out, because that money did come to the airport after we left. In fact, it came at a tune of $160 million. And that's, that was reported in the papers last year, around June, I believe. By this time, we had already left Black like, Bureau. The bathroom has not even been repaired at the airport. For any of y'all that went to Black like, in the last few months, if it looks any different than when you went there the year before or anything, or, or even five years, precisely. So if $160 million comes to for supposedly airport repair, we should have clean bathroom at a minimum. Potholes should be fixed in the runway. So they have put this thing out there under the, maybe when they need us to send paperwork to America, the other partners that the, you know, the government, that the government works with our other foreign partners, other people who continue to have eyes on Liberia, they said it was coming to fix the airport. So because of that, the managing director's signature will be required and mind you now, this managing director that was sitting in the chair at the time was calling Ghana to get their own contracts and so forth so that she and the lawyer could work together and make sure that what was being done at RIA was comparable. Are you going to arrest them? He laughed and said, no, this is Liberia. I'm not going to arrest them. So he said, what I suggest you do, go and ask the president for an investigation. Tell her you want an investigation, you want an audit. That way everything will come out, it will blow up in their faces, then it will embarrass them, then everything will be all right. So we took his advice and we were headed for the president to ask her for an official investigation into us being threatened, into what was going on regarding our lives. On the way to the president, we decided to follow Liberia's chain of command, meaning you can't just, because you know the president, you can't pass over your bosses and just go to the president. So as we're trying to respect and follow the chain of command, the president starts to send people to intercept us. These people would come, one of them is a Senator Clarice Jai we released. Because in that recording, you will hear the president, president reference the people that she had sent to us to tell us to not do an investigation. So we have to play all those people's recordings first so that when you hear the president's recording, it'll make sense. Long story short, she said all those things to us on recording. We left. The people now decided that they would heighten the threats. When we went back to Roberts Field, where Ellen Corcoran lived, the chief of all the airport security, a guy by the name of Mr. Suba, S-U-B-A-H, he pulled us to the side. It was in the evening. He said, boss man, it's not safe for you here. We said, what are you talking about? He said, oh, the, the government official, this is on recording too. He said, the government officials came here and they threatened me. And they threatened me, they told me we have to find a way to sabotage y'all. They have turned off the lights at uh, Ellen Corcoran's house. They have turned off the water. They have replaced the security guard. They have brought in new security guard. He said, I beg y'all, y'all have to leave. If y'all don't leave, I cannot guarantee your safety. These people are dangerous, etc., etc., etc. So we left Roberts Field. We came back in town, and as God would have it, you know, God, God is so good. Amen. The, Amen. the, the police director, Chris Massaqua, uh, he has family here in the Lawrenceville area. I've interacted with them, but if any of them here, they can tell you I don't know them that well. We're not that close. He called me on the phone. Judge Johnson, where are you? I said, Director Massaqua, I'm in town. He said, come to my house. He has a house on the Duval Road area. I had never been there. All the years I have been going, I heard he has a nice big house, etc. but I had never been there. He called me to his house. We went there, Ellen Corcoran and I. We sat down. By that time, we were tired. He fed us cassava leaf and fever tea. We ate. We drank. Then he asked me, he said, what's going on? I said, Chris, you tell me what's going on because people are threatening us. People are plotting to kill us. We're just trying to help. You tell me what's going on. Long story short, I told him, I said, you know what? I'm not even going to explain to you. Call the guy at the airport who they just also threatened because he refused to sabotage us. So he picks up the phone, he calls the airport guy, the guy explains what he had explained to us about the government threatening him, etc. And then the director of police, this is how good God is, the director of police said, no, but I can't do it. We said, Chris, you can't do what? What are you talking about? He said, y'all don't know this, but I just came from a meeting with the president. She just ordered a security meeting with me and the director of police, the head of NSA, the head of immigration, and in that meeting, she said, we have to capture y'all. Y'all cannot leave. I said, Chris, what are you talking about? He said, no, I'm telling you. He says, but based on what I heard, based on what is going on, I'm not going to do it. 
So when he had called me to his house, when he had called us to his house, he was intending to capture us. And, wow. uh, and not knowing we went to his house. Amen. So long story short, he told us what the president has said. In fact, he said, it, you know, I knew it didn't make sense. He said, because after they had met, he, he asked the president, he said, Mama, what crime did these two people uh, commit? What charges? And he said, she just told him, say, catch them, uh, uh, capture them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so long story short, he called the U.S. He told us, he said, look, I'm not going to capture you. I'm going to do what I can to help you leave, but you cannot go back to get clothes. You cannot go back to get suitcase. The clothes that are on you now, you have to leave Liberia right now. He says, if you don't leave, I cannot guarantee that tomorrow morning you will be alive or there will not be some armed robbery.